All right, so let's get started talking about foundations and vertical placements. So a little meme before I get started. I have never bought anything with money. Everything I have was bought with pieces of my time, sold from my life to a job that will never pay me enough when my time is up. If that is your attitude right now, then that's kind of where I was sometimes when I was pouring concrete, where I literally, you know, my life, you only have so much time in your life. And, you know, you're, you're, you work by the hour. And, you know, at the end of the day, you got to realize what's important to you and what's not. And I love construction. I love working with my hands. It's really fun going out and, and doing concrete. But it's important to realize that um, you need to always, I always encourage people to come and um, fight for their dreams. And so one of those ways is going out and, um, and you're getting a better education and learning more about concrete and moving up, not just being a laborer your whole life. So concrete foundations. Um, I didn't get I didn't get a chance to put in a throw in a cool picture here, but in essence, there's a lot of different types of concrete foundations. We have, uh, the, you know, depending on the type of foundation, the design, it's going to be all sorts of different rebar layouts and configurations. Um, you know, usually usually concrete foundations they're going to have um, obviously higher volumes of concrete. Um, a lot of times than maybe just like a floor slab, depending on how big your floor slab is. So it's pretty common for a foundation to, to, to have a lot, a lot more volume. Um, also with foundations, you may have foundations that are actually mass pores, meaning that the heat of hydration or the, the temperature change of that, of that concrete is going to uh, be great enough where it constitutes to be a mass pour concrete, meaning you're pouring a gigantic chunk of concrete at once, and you might have some thermal cracking in that. So your concrete's gonna get above 100 and roughly 58 uh, degrees F, or if the change is more than 35 degrees from the middle of your concrete to the edge of your concrete where your form start, then um, that is considered mass concrete. So you need to do a check on that. Um, and also foundations this is probably one of the most commonly inspected concrete elements that you have is people want, are really focused on making sure you have a good, that your concrete, uh, that, that structure is gonna be built on a good solid foundation. Because if not, that's how you get failure. So over on the left is a strip footing, um, you know, four pieces of rebar, um, you know, tied together, like you see there, and it was dug with a with a with an excavator. Over on the right is a rectangular pier. Um, here, this will actually support a column and a building, is what this one was. But you can see how there's different mats of of rebar that are layered. And there's mul multiple layers of rebar there. I think there are three or four layers. Um, and you can see how they're, they're spaced at six by six. We talk about other types. So, um, you know, this is also a, a strip. You know, you have a strip footing with the piers. They come together. They can also meet a strip <laughs> footing with piers, especially around the edges. You may have it where you have columns like we have here, um, where uh, there'll be anchor bolts and stuff. Um, that you can put into the, into the foundation if you want to, or you can come back and drill them in. Um, that's kind of what you see there. You also have a thing called a spread footing, where you have a basic strip footing like, like, like you see, we've already talked about with a backhoe digging in, and the soil, and then right on top of that um, foundation, or on, right on top of that strip footing, you actually have a stem wall that comes in. And so together that meets a spread footing and it works really well. It has creates a really great moment of inertia. So it has a lot, you know, the bending, the bending of that concrete. So it's a deep beam without all the concrete on the side. So 
Um, so there's lots of structural aspects to that that help. You also have things like a pier. So this is a, a drawing that um, of a pier being dug. And so it goes in there, you think about like a bridge deck or a bridge at the very bottom that's supporting that a lot of times in the middle of that, of that uh, creek or river, you will actually have a pier that's, that's drilled down in there. So, you know, and usually you want to drill until you hit rock bottom. Down Louisiana, there's not a lot of rock bottom. So they a lot of times will drill to 60 feet and then just stop, which is kind of crazy, but um, uh, it seems to work out pretty well for them. Uh, wind turbine mat, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, you know, you can talk about lots of different types of mats. We talk about a mat uh, footing. It's whenever there's multiple layers of, 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 of rebar and each, each layer of rebar is uh, referred to sometimes as a mat. And those mats are usually stacked up, like you can see here. Um, there's multiple, multiple different layers that are all stacked together. And that's what a mat footing is. So when we talked about that pier way back there, that's actually could be considered um, there's multiple mats in there, so it could be considered a mat footing also. But usually mat footing is just this gigantic, huge footing with a variety of different um, rebar layout. And so, um, you know, it's real common for uh, bank vaults to do that or uh, structures that have high loads to have uh, mat layers on them. So construction methods for designing a pier. Um, so H Howard Baker, I think, actually created this figure, kind of cool. Um, but um, I need to go in and, 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 and write my own one. But this is pretty cool. Uh, shows you the basic process. So you can take this auger. You can actually drill down in there, pull the auger out, put your, your, your uh, actual reinforcement stay a cage, and put that back down in there. And then you can pour the concrete right on top of that. That is usually called a dry, the dry method. You can also have it where the casing um, installed as the auger to drill out um, into the soil. And within the casing of that, this, um, you can actually have concrete, um, which is kind of cool. So you can actually have one of the methods to go and drill out up here is to have it where um, the middle of this auger bit has um, slurry that goes that um, can be poured down in there. And so as you raise up your bit, you can actually go through and pour concrete down in here and raise that all up. So that's kind of cool. Um, I can see here the, the auger case method will do that. And then you can either push that cage down in there. Um, you can also, if you don't, you know, sometimes people actually have to check the bottom of these piers. They send somebody down in there to make sure everything looks good. It can kind of be scary. So this auger case method can work pretty well. Um, there's also other, other, other methods that, um, the slurry method and stuff where things can work, you know, work pretty well to create a pier. So there's different methods um, to, to do a pier. I just kind of want to kind of go over that for a minute. When we talk about, say, like a, you saw an example of a wind uh, turbine, usually, you know, uh, these wind farms, they come in and they're getting built and sometimes there's 30, 40, 50 or more of these um, turbines and each turbine has their own space to uh, is spaced in a certain way where they really have their own foundation. They're, and I've seen a lot of them where they're about 30 or 300 cubic yards of concrete. They're built with a massive amount of, of reinforcement still. Um, usually the compressor strengths are usually about 3000, 4000 PSI. And I've seen some of them where they, their slump range is usually, you know, five inch slump plus or minus um, two inches. So, you know, three to five inches is pretty common. You know, if they really like it well wet, you know, five to five to seven, five to eight inches. But you're really pushing it um, as you get uh, too wet. So that's kind of like a zoom in of, of the cage, what it kind of looks like. 
of these different mats where you have your pedestal over here and it's all being tied down into this mat and this mat's kind of flat see here this is the ground of it and then you have uh, different mats that are all uh, lined together that are lapped um, stacked on top of one another on each side and um and so you know it creates this this shape of um, it kind of creates this shape. So whenever you go and you pour that, you can have your um, teleconveyor. It's actually pouring down into that. And then literally, there does, if you look, there's like four people, four guys that are sitting there um, pouring the pour the pedestal and the concrete and everything. So it's an it's a huge process. There's a lot of concrete. It doesn't take as much manpower because literally you're just pouring a bunch of concrete in a hole um, with rebar, but you know, it's an all day thing. And these gentlemen here um, are really more focused on the finish, the final product of how that looks. And the funny part is, is a, lot, a lot of this will actually be covered with dirt later. So, um, you know, so it doesn't have to look perfect. But this pedal stool and, and everything needs to all, you know, the concrete needs to be, um, they're pouring the top of it right now and they're going to fill in the rest of, of the concrete here in a second. So it's all nice one mono, monolithic concrete. So, um, so pretty cool, but there's a bunch of concrete, 300 yards usually. I think about, I think this one's actually 300 yards is what they poured um, to get there with this. And then you can see how they have their their sheets, um, their curing curing blankets and stuff. They'll put on it um, here in a little bit. So mixed design for a foundation like that's usually three to five thousand psi, non air and trained, um, two inches to eight inch slump, depending on you know um, your ability to consolidate the concrete, the reinforcement spacing, so how close those rebar spacing is together and then what you're actually using. So most of the time um, you, you may use a pump, you may use a chute. Um, it just really just depends on, um, on, on, the, on their preference. So uh, when we talk about a mixed design, you know, foundations in general, whether we're talking about wind turbine or just, just a foundation in general, they're going to, a lot of times they may have higher amounts of fly ash and slag, especially if it's a mass pour. Um, they can have 3,000 to 5,000 psi. Um, is very common for for foundations in general. Um, but whenever you go and you look at the soil, you want to make sure there's no sulfates in it. You want to make sure that the nominal maximum coarse aggregate size and that rebar spacing is going to work out just fine. And then your dimensions and the temperature for that. Um, you know, it, it's going to be enough where, um, is it going to be a mass pour or not is, is the question. And if it is, you need to go through and make sure that your mixture design is done in such a way where you're not going to have those problems. Um, whether it's the temperature or the sulfates, if, if your rebar spacing is so close together that you can't use a, you know, one and a half inch normal maximum size, um, you know, you may have to go down to a, a number 57 for one inch or a number 67 for three quarters of an inch. So a lot of times these foundations, they don't get into contact a lot with water. So, um, well, you know, unless you're on the, on, on a interacting with water or something, a lot of times they're just under dirt and they're not going anywhere. So a 0.5 water cement ratio or higher is not a, um, is not, you know, is, 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 is pretty common. Like we talked about, inspectors a lot of times will come out and inspect the, uh, for a footing. They'll come out and inspect it. So this is a, uh, a shallow floor slab. So I think this is 18 inches from the top of, this is a, the slab of the concrete and the rectangular um, strip footing are all, are all connected together. And they poured it all at once. So you can see here, this was actually a, uh, um, a footing that got rejected because well, number one, the dirt wasn't cleaned out here. 
all the way. You need to have your dirt where it sets, um, you know, where it sets, you know, the formwork sets right on top of the dirt work, not, you don't want your slab to set directly on, on grass right here. You want it to be all the way to the edge. That's what the blueprints say. So you need to make sure you take out your dirt clods and remove that, make it, you know, clean up the, the, the forms, make them nice, make them look nice and, and clean. Um, <clears throat> and so inspectors will come out and they will check for some of those basic things like you don't have dirt clods or, or your rebar spacing are they correct or dimensions of your footing, are they within tolerance, stuff like that. So you can kind of basic list um, we talk about walls, so, you know, like maybe you have a basement wall there, or you may have something, you know, I have a picture of a column, but there may be, you know, something like what you think of as a column. So think about this basement wall, if it's a lot smaller and short or shorter or taller, I should say, a lot much taller, but, uh, maybe it's two foot by two foot or four foot by four foot type dimensions, but it's 20 foot tall. Um, so there's formwork all the way around that column. Talk about silos or maybe a, a, a dam. This is a private dam I did um, right here. And so it's very common to, um, so we can talk about different vertical placements as the concrete's being placed um, from the bottom up. So how else, what kind of all works. So most vertical placements I've seen usually between three and 5,000 PSI is pretty common. Usually it's gonna be non air entering concrete. It's gonna be exposed to freestall resistance then, then you need to add air into it. The slump uh, uh, is gonna be between two and eight inches depending on, um, depending on what the mix is and the placement and uh, the reinforcement spacing and, and, and you know, how, how heavy do you want the formwork to to be leaning on uh, the concrete to be leaning on that formwork. As you get you know stiffer and stiffer mixes, you can have less pressure actually being put on that formwork. Um, so just kind of you know kind of realize some of that. And we won't go into for too much about formwork pressure here, but it is important to some of the basics. So there's a another class that you'll have of structures one that talks about more about formwork. So when we talk about the construction of a dam. This is kind of, um, you know, a little private dam we did of, um, about, about 20 years ago, really, um, for somebody. And this is the basics where we actually dug a strip footing, we poured the strip footing, and we laid out, or right after, the, after the concrete got hard, we laid out that, um, the boards on each side, and then we started setting up the formwork. And we drilled down in, in there and we put, we did have rebar on this. Not all dams, a lot of dams don't have rebar because they're massive sizes. This one was, uh, is a, really a very small dam. Whenever you look at some of, you know, things like Hoover Dam and stuff like that. So, um, you know, a lot of dams don't always have re reinforcement in them. Um, but this dam is, you know, the next step, we laid out all of our, our farm work tied everything together, and then we let it cure. After we poured it, we let it cure, and it rained pretty bad. So, um, you know, this is kind of what it looked like later. So we had to go up. Um, so first step was we actually had to go up, um, up, up Creek. We had to uh, stop up, put a temporary dam up, and divert the water. Luckily, we were able to divert it. So we could go through and dig our um, dig our actual uh, concrete uh, strip footing here. So that's what the excavator is doing there. And you want to always dig well, you know, well back on each side of the creek bed of, of this bed. You don't want to just dig like right here. Um, you want to be pretty far back in there so that um, water can't can't um, erode. And, and go around that. So, so you go and you build yourself a footing, nice and nice and stiff, and um, you know you poured your footing. And you can see here 
how the sides of that of that of that footing are pretty are pretty uh, you know it's not straight it's because you know the, the concrete or the dirt that's in there is pretty wet we actually had a pump if you see there we had a pump that actually pumped water to the other to the other side so that um, anything that got you know any water that got uh, that wasn't able to be held back by that temporary dam and went through that temporary dam that we had upstream that pump was able to pump um, oh, off that off the site. Um, and so our next step, like I said, we, we laid it out. So we took some two by fours or two by sixes, I forget. And we laid out kind of what we wanted. Um, and that's, you know, then we started building our, um, our forms and these forms take take forever to build. We did have reinforcement in them. Um, you know, so we had reinforcement that was connected. We drilled down into the, the foundation and we had, uh, um, you know, reinforcement that went straight up out of, the, out of the foundation, all the way up to the top. And we had it all connected throughout it. So we wanted to make sure that this thing was gonna be structurally sound enough we had a design engineer that designed everything. So you can see that pump, so the water wouldn't get too much here. We would pump out the water. Um, we'd have a hose that went all the way on the other side. So we're, we're sitting here building up our, our bracing on our wall. So we have our, um, after we put our, our clamps down, um, we came back through with horse, with our horizontal two by fours and we um, hooked everything onto those clamps and we came back with vertical studs and um, you know to go and create even more bracing. So we talked we've talked about in the past about formwork where we have concrete pressure um, that kind of looks like a retaining wall pressure. Then you may have a moment for maybe a live load that you may want to incorporate into your formwork. I always try to, um, and so that's why you need like a, a stake and, and then maybe a kicker. So you have a bracing, you know, um, area there just to make sure that form won't move. So that kicker is going to help with a moment, any live moment. That stake is going to help with some of the basics of, of just the formwork. So. You can see here that with the formwork that the inside of, of what you think of where you have your, um, you know, your wire, there's little hooks on the ends. There's going to be little clamps that are going to clamp on each end um, to kind of keep those boards together. And then you put your um, wood, your, your two by four, you put those all through there to kind of connect them together. And you do it in a little grid, uh, grid pattern where, um, it really um, holds up your forms really well. And you can build a very tall structures by doing this. So <clears throat> we had on this project a 50 year flood or, or sorry, a hundred year flood and a 500 year flood. Um, the rain that year was so unbelievable. It actually knocked out a lot of our forms and knocked off our temporary dam that we had upstream and it was just very rough. Um, each time it rained, it, it did that. So with a 100 and 500 year flood. Then we also had, so you can see them rebuilding the formwork after that happened. And we had these rocks that we actually, after we finished doing all the dirt work or pouring the concrete and everything, we actually took quite a few rocks and at, put them here at the dam so that they kind of help um to make sure that you know this thing wasn't going to um water wasn't going to come down this low to create um to, to to you know to really help with the with the load loading and stuff so whenever we went to pour the concrete you're going to treat it just like you're going to do a wall with an internal vibrator so you may have your first lift um you know the very bottom lift then you do your second lift each each of these lifts that you're going to have, which may be, I've done lifts at one foot, and maybe two foot, three foot, five foot. I've seen some that go all the way up to nine feet. I highly recommend when you start hitting, you know, six, seven, eight, nine foot, 
you really got to be careful that um, you really got to be careful when you vibrate things adequately and you're not going too fast because a lot of times you won't be able to consolidate that concrete properly. So you got to be real careful. You want that vibrator to at least penetrate one inch, one inch in that previous layer so that um, it's one monolithic pore. If you don't penetrate in that previous layer, what happens is it just creates a little, you know, a joint, a cold joint is what it looks like. So those layers don't get connected together. And you want to make sure the spacing in between each, um, in between whenever you're vibrating a, a lift, that spacing is, is properly done. You do not want to drag the vibrator through that concrete. You do not want to do it. Okay, don't do it. Please don't do it. There's a systematic approach to doing it. <clears throat> so understanding your mix design and that sphere of influence. So over on the top right, um, understanding how that sphere of influence looks. That's kind of, you know, you want a nice, good sphere of influence. If not, you may want to change your mix design. If you want to go with a mix, um, then you need to, you know, maybe change up your, your um, spacing, you know. So if your size of your sphere of influence is like this little small circle here, and that's, you can't change anything with your mix design to get maybe something that looks more like this, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to change up your spacing. So you may have to vibrate at two different spots. Um, <clears throat> so you may have to vibrate here and here, and then you move up, vibrate there, vibrate there, move up, vibrate there, vibrate there. And so it may be, you know, this is, again, this is looking straight down. If you're the vibrator guy and, on your, and you're on the top of the wall, this is what I'm talking about. Vibrate there, there, vibrate there. So you go down this one spot. That's when you're actually going to move um, straight down into the page, into the wall, and then you pull it back up. So this is really just looking at the, um, uh, an aerial view of the X and Y of, 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 of what, if a vibrator man was sitting there looking straight down, trying to vibrate. So <clears throat> you don't want to have just a sphere of influence that doesn't connect, doesn't vibrate all the concrete. You want it where it vibrates all the concrete, but you don't want to push it out in such a way we start creating, um, uh, you know, water and segregating the concrete. So internal vibrator, when it's going down, it's going to have these little air pockets and the vibration is going to be going outward of it in some type of spherical um, pattern, like I talked about, so the sphere of influence. And it's going to remove anything within its path, with any of, um, it's going to remove all of that. So. This is what good vibration looks like. This is what bad vibration looks like. You don't want to have water going out the bottom of your forms. That's not good. Whenever you pull those forms off later, that's a lot of times that's what you're going to see. So a lot of times when, when a vibrator guy is going to be holding that vibrator in one spot for a really long time, um, he's going to create segregation and he's going to push that water out of those forms. So you really don't want to keep your vibrator in one spot. It should be always moving in an up, down direction, um, stuff like that. So up, down direction, it should always be moving. So when we talk about mock-ups, mock-ups are a huge deal. You might say, well, why are they so big? Well, that's actually all these things you see here. That would have, you would have never had any of those problems if you would have done a mock-up. You would have ever had any of these issues. So a mock-up, they're great because you can take, you can go and find like maybe a smaller scaled model or just a smaller, little smaller area. And you go out and you take your concrete, you go out and you can actually evaluate it. You go out and make just a little small, a small micro scaled version of what you're gonna do. Um, that might be in the yard, you know, maybe it's the concrete producer's yard or the construction yard, or maybe a small place out on your site or maybe you just want, you know, maybe it's uh, one place, it's one of the really small places that, that um, where you don't have to pour everything, you can pour that one little bitty area and it will work out just fine. And you go out there and you do a mock up and you figure out what worked good and what didn't. And you make some adjustments, maybe it's to your mix design, maybe it's your construction practices and, 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 you, and you iterate to a certain place where 
your placement where your construction practices are going to work, your, your concrete mixture design is going to work, and it'll really help you out through the rest of the process. So you're not spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year trying to fix all these issues. So you may go out and do a wall, you may put your reinforcement, I know this isn't finished, but you may put some reinforcement down on a wall and you may do some basic, you know, check out your sphere of influences and, you know, and see how well things are actually working. And you can pull out your forms and check for good and bad vibration. You can go look, just, you, know, you can kind of rank it. Um, this is a box test, something, a test I developed looking at slip form pavers. But you can go through it and use the same void scale and actually rank the sides of the concrete. So it does a pretty good job. And again, one thing I want to critically make sure people realize, unseen events do happen in construction every day. And sometimes you just shake your head and go, I don't know why that happened, but it did. And so people persevere all the time in construction. Um, there's very hardworking, tough people that are in this every day. And um, I'm extremely biased. And obviously I think the, the concrete guys are, 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 are kind of a, even a, a step up from everybody else, but I'm very biased obviously, because I'm a concrete guy. And so that's kind of the, the kind of completion of that dam. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, have, have a great rest of your day.